It says on here. It's on here. Anyway, my family's scattered out here on the front row. I'd like a word with them just for a minute. Oh, don't clap for them. <laughs> Family listening now? Y'all quit picking on me. I've just had it. I can't take anymore. No. <laughs> Y'all give them a hand now, praise the Lord. <laughs> It is good to see you this morning. We have been in a series of messages where we've been talking about breaking free and discovering the freedom that really belongs to us. Far too many people living in all types of captivity in their life. Last week, if you weren't here, we talked about levels of bondage. How that some people can drift so far away from God and denying God in their life that they get all kinds of captivity in their life. We talk about different levels. I mean, we, we took it all the way to the extreme level, like the maniac of the gathering, when that guy, the demoniac, who's out in the, he's out in the cemeteries and, you know, cutting himself and nobody could help him. He's breaking chains to the milder things that too many Christians deal with in their own spiritual lives of just not being able to have disciplines in their own life, you know, not being able to have, fulfill commitments, having relationship problems, and on and on it goes. And if you are a believer, then God never intended for you to live this kind of sub-life. I mean, what it says in the Bible, and what it offers in the Bible, is fact and real and available. But, as we said last week, probably 65% of the Christian community does not experience those levels of freedom in their life that God wants them to experience. You know, when the Bible talks about a joy that's full of glory, guess what kind of joy is available to the believer? The joy that's full of glory. And the Bible talks about a peace that passes all comprehension. That's available to the believer. Second Corinthians it says, Now thanks be unto God which gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, there's this, there's this gift that God has made available to any per person who comes to Christ, and that is victory in their life. And all too often, I think, too many believers, they read those things in the Bible, and then they look at where they are genuinely at in their life, and they see there's this chasm, I mean, this big gap valley or gap between the truth of Scripture and where they are in their life. Now, some people just kind of settle into numbness and accept it. All right, well, I just, you know, I guess I'm not the kind of Christian I need to be. And they listen to all this stuff that goes on in their head. Remember, we talked about each week where the battle takes place in the mind. And they listen and, and they lose the battle for the mind immediately and they just settle into some kind of, not even mediocrity, I, don't even, I think it's well below mediocrity of what God has for them in their spiritual walk in life. So we get into this series, after talking about last week, not only the levels of bondage, we talked about the way of escape. First Corinthians says that there is no temptation taking you, but such is as common to man. Understand what that means. It means that you're not going to be tempted any more than anybody else. So that kind of does away with our excuse, well, I'm special, I'm unique, you don't know my situation, you don't know how I was raised, you don't know what I've dealt with, you don't know how, no, no. The Bible says we're all tempted. It's common to every man. But then it goes on to say, but God will with every temptation. In other words, every temptation comes, something else comes with it. What else comes with it? There's a way of escape. There's a way not to fall. There's a way not to, 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 to fall into the, the pit that's been laid out before you. With every temptation, there is a way of escape so that you might be able to bear it. In other words, so temptation is going to come to everybody. We're not going to avoid it. We're not going to get out of it. It happens to all of us. But we don't have to lose in that battle every time it comes. There's a way of escape. We close the verse out of James where it talks about draw nigh to God and he'll draw nigh unto you. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Now, that, important to get that in the right order. First of all, you've got to develop your relationship with God. You grow out of him, you get things right with God, and then it says you resist the devil and he will flee from you. Too many people kind of ignore that first step of submitting to God, surrendering to his will in, in their lives, and just, I'm not, I'm not going to do this, or I'm not going to do that, or, and, and they're fighting out here in the strength of their own flesh, in, in their own energy, by their own power, and they keep falling flat on their face. So, temptation comes to everybody. By the way, that's not sin. Some people just feel guilty because they're tempted. But not only does temptation come, it also comes with a way of escape. And bottom line to that is Jesus is that way of escape. I'm the way, the truth, the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. But there is the point of your responsibility. If you want to walk in victory, you can. You have to make some decisions. Sometimes they're hard decisions, they're tough decisions, but you have to do what you know God has told you is the right thing to do. Even when that way seems I can't do that, it's impossible. 
That's why Jesus comes. That's why he provides himself during these temptations because he gives you what you need when you need it to overcome in these things in your life. Far too many people, as we say, miss that. In fact, most people live, you know, uh, with the uh, attitudes of, of self-depreciation in their spiritual life. I, I'm not talking about, you know, the, 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 the mindset of the culture world is love yourself and all that stuff that goes along with that and, you know, the, the humanism that's all wrapped up in that. But, you know, in my old flesh, there's nothing there that's, that's appreciable. There's nothing there of value. Paul said, in me it dwells no good thing. But he did go on to talk about who he was in Christ after that. He talked his, about his new identity in Jesus Christ. He talked about how he was treasured by God, how he's accepted in the blood, how he's now called a saint for God. Now he's been set apart for God. He's been made righteous by God. All these things that talked about who he is once salvation's come. Most Christians never get to that point in their life to have that appreciation of who, who God has made them. They're still struggling with who they were in their old life and have never walked into the new life with this whole new arena around you where you've been made different. If any man is in Christ, 2 Corinthians 5, 17. I think that's probably every church I ever preached in. The audience knew that verse. If any man's in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things pass away. All things become new. Well, they know it in their head, but now it needs to get down into their heart because you are not what you used to be. I mean, that was like sermon one or two of this whole series. You've been made different. You've been made new. And once that supernatural, I mean, I, there's no other way to describe it. It is not natural to this world. It is a supernatural, super incredible spiritual event, cosmically, where God moves in and you're made different. All right? It hasn't got anything to do with your feelings. It hasn't got anything to do with, with the externals. It anything to do with how, how you relate to it on an emotional basis, but... Man, God does something in your life, and you can believe it because you put your faith in him. And he does not lie. So you want to walk in this place where you're not living with this, this attitude of self-depreciation you know, you know, of, oh, I'm just no good, and I'll never be anything for God, and I'm not qualified. Man, that's where so many people are. And why God not doing anything in their life, they're just paralyzed in that mindset. They won't go out and witness, well, you know, I'm not perfect, and I just, what if I make a mistake? And it's all that stuff of just me and self and just more junk. All based upon the old life and who you were and not who you are in Christ. When you came into a relationship, if you have come into a relationship with Jesus Christ, you have been made alive in him. You're dead to sin. You're a new person. You're seated with Christ in heavenly places. He lives in you. You live in him. The world's changed ultimately. Therefore, you're qualified. Therefore, you're righteous. Therefore, you can be what God's called you to be. He made it possible. But here's the way Satan works. And if you, you know, whether you're a believer or not believer, catch how this, because I think you'll see it, how it works. It's like a one-two punch, you know, right and the left. And he, he's pretty good at this. He's been doing it a long time. The one-two punch works like this. First of all, comes the temptation, and then comes the accusation. It's like, oh, do this. Do, and everybody else is doing it. I want you to, hey, hey, it's fun. You know, try this. Or, or look at this. Watch this. Go there. You know, say this. And all of a sudden, you know, it's pleasure and sin for a season, right? So all comes this enticement to sin. And then he says something like this. After he says, okay, I'll do it, I'll do it. And you jump in and do it. And you say, oh, you are so worthless. I can't believe you just did that. And he was the one just selling you the bill of goods, right? Oh, look, I can't, you call yourself a Christian. You think, look at you. I, I, and, and then it comes the accusation. That's, his, that's you know, a methodology he's used from day one. I mean, it has never changed. He is the father of lies. He entices, he appeals with lies. And then once you bid on it, then comes the accusation. He begins to just beat you down and gives you the beating of your life. That, that's the way he works. In fact, the Bible calls him the accuser of the brethren. In Revelation, I love this passage of 12 because it's talking about the demise of our enemy. I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, now has come salvation and strength in the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before God day and night. So it kind of tells you what God thinks about him. It kind of tells you what his title is. It kind of tells you how he operates and how he works. It shouldn't take us by surprise that he does this. And he calls him the accuser of the brethren. He's always looking for something to find in you. He's always looking for something to tear down in you. He's always looking for something to take apart in you. You know, you're a pitiful excuse for a child of God. You'll never amount to anything for God. You, and so many people, 
They listen to those things and they believe what they hear and they live in this little state of condemnation and accusation and there's no good news to the good news at all. The reality of the whole thing here is, folks, we don't have to take what he says. I mean, the subtitle for today's part was don't believe everything you hear. All right? And where do you hear it? You hear it here. Sometimes you hear it from other people. They, they just agree. And boy, this is why God hates gossip. All right? Why? Because you line yourself up with the devil when you start talking about people and making accusations. You know, well, they're this, or they're not friendly, or I can't stand them, or they do this, or they did that. And you're just right in line. The Bible says it's the devil who stands before God. That's why God says in, 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 in Scripture, he says, listen, there's several, six things I hate. I'll tell you one of them, so, those who sow discord among the brethren. Somebody tried to dish now. That's because the whole accusation thing is built into this. So what we want to do is get our play, ourselves in a place of freedom and a place of victory. One, we don't take it and we don't participate. You know, I am free in Christ. I'm going to stand my ground in freedom in Jesus Christ. So we move forward at that point. There's this passage. I've shared it at Christmas, this, this message. Not necessarily a, a text that you would take for a Christmas message. But you know me, I'm, I'm a bit strange in more ways than one. Don't say amen. But in Zechariah, there's this passage where the high priest Joshua is standing before God. You get a little bit of picture in this, in this scenario here of the holy of holies, basically, of, of what takes place. And he's the high priest. He's confessed the sins of the nation. And he's standing before God. And he's clothed in all this filth and all this sin. Let, let's read it. And then, and then we'll look at it a little bit closer. He says, Then he showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord, and Satan standing right at his right hand to accuse him. And the Lord said to Satan, the Lord rebuke you, Satan. Indeed, the Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Is not this, is not this a, a, a brand plucked from the fire? Now Joshua was clothed with filthy garments and standing before the angel. And he spoke and he said to those who were standing before him saying, remove the filthy garments. This is God speaking. Remove the filthy garments from him. And again, he said to him, see, I've taken your iniquity away from you and I will clothe you with festal robes. Then I said... Let them put a clean turban on his head. So they put a clean turban on his head and they clothed him with garments while the angel of the Lord was standing by. And the angel of the Lord admonished Joshua saying, thus says the Lord of hosts, if you walk in my ways and if you perform my services, then you will also govern my house and have charge of my courts and I will grant you free access among those who are standing here. Now listen, Joshua the high priest, you and your friends who are sitting in front of you, indeed they are men, Catches, who are but a symbol for behold, I'm going to bring my, in my servant the branch. Now, it's a prophetic picture what's taking place here of what's going to happen one day. It says, all you're experiencing here is just a symbol. There's going to be another Joshua. We pronounce it in the English language, Jesus. All right? And he's, he's my branch. Jesus said, I, I, my father's the vine. I, you know, I, my father's the true vine. You know, I, I'm the branch. You, you know, uh, you, you're the branch in me. So here's Jesus. He stands... Now, to be that prototype of what you see with Joshua here, who's literally named Jesus, that's what the name means, and he stands there clad in filthy garments. God said, all this is just a symbol, because I'm going to do this in my, in my servant, the branch. For behold, the stone which I've set before Joshua, on one stone are seven eyes. Behold, I will engrave an inscription on it, declares the Lord of hosts. And listen, I will remove the iniquity of that land in one day. In that day, declares the Lord of hosts, every one of you will invite his neighbor to sit under his vine and under his fig tree. What's he saying? Everything, first of all, you're saying here is just a picture of what's coming. I'm going to send my servant. He's going to take on your filthy clothes. All right? He's going to, he's going to, he's going to take upon your sin upon himself. All right? And I'm going to satisfy my righteous judgment in a day. What do you mean? The Bible makes it very clear that the wages of sin is death. Now, what's that mean? It means that sin is here and it's already under judgment. There's already, God's already made a judgment about sin, all right? And he's already made a judgment about sinners. The soul that sins shall die. I mean, you find that over and over in Scripture that the wages of sin is death, all right? Jesus comes... Stands in, takes our place, is our propitiations, the King James says. He stands in and takes upon my filthy garments, my sin, my unrighteousness, in my place. And pays the price. What price? Death. And in a day, this issue 
of sin and death and judgment is settled. Jesus said it like this. If you believe on me, you'll not be condemned. The judgment of death will not hang over you. But if you believe not, you're condemned already. I mean, there's no hope if you reject Jesus, is what he's saying. There's no way out. There's, there's no escape. And we see it here in the book of Zechariah, prophetically, as it's laid out before us. And, and, and catch this. It, the content of this is great for believers in this. Look, look at the cast of characters. The judge, obviously, is God the Father. Now, the prosecuting attorney, the accuser here, is Satan. The defending attorney in our life, we'll see in a moment, is Jesus. It becomes very clear. The accused defendant is Joshua, standing there on behalf of the people, clothed in filthy garments, under judgment and under accusation and under sentence by what's going on. The devil says, hey, look at him. Tells the guy, look at him. He's, he's in filthy garments. You're righteous. He's unrighteous. You're clean. He's unclean. You said no unclean thing can be before you. So he deserves the sentence of judgment. He deserves to die. You see this in the book of Job, right? He's up and he said, where you been? I've been out, looking, I'm out accusing the brethren, basically. So God rebukes the devil. And he says this, in a nutshell, you're not the judge. You can't pass sentence on anybody. You can't pass sentence on my people. In other words, Satan can make an accusation, but his charges don't stick. You know, he's going to lose in the courtroom of God every time in regard to God's children. That's where Paul is going to in Romans 8 when he, when he makes the statement in Romans chapter 8 about this whole issue of laying the charge. Who can lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifies. Who is he that condemns? It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again, who's even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. He said the only one that condemns you is Jesus, and he doesn't. He prays for you. He intercedes for you. Uh, I believe that the Bible gets real clear on this issue that this liar, this father of lies, this accuser of the brethren, stands before God day and night and his demons, and they accuse us personally before God. I think we can see that clearly in Scripture. Say, how could he do that? That's just what he does. He has a pretend authority. He's out to accuse you. He hates you. He hates God. And since God made you, he wants to destroy you because you remind him of God. Even if you're backslidden, you remind him of God. Even if you're lost, he hates you. You remind him of God. He comes in and says stuff like, how could you? I can't believe you would. You're not really a Christian. You don't really love Jesus. You're not really a child of God. And on and on it goes. But remember, Satan's not your judge. He's your accuser. Unfortunately, what people do is they listen. And they start believing. And they start getting that idea, well, you know, I, I just, I guess I'm not any good. I guess I'll never amount to anything. I'll never be what God wants me to be. There's no way over this sin. I guess I'm just going to be stuck in this one thing all the rest of my life. And everybody else does. And everybody else seems to be. So I don't guess there's really any hope. And maybe, the, maybe God didn't really mean all that in the Bible. Maybe I misunderstood her. Or maybe I'm just not special to him like other people might be. And we just believe that stuff. When in reality, we ought to respond and say, I don't belong to you. But he says, arms, you are stupid. Don't ask for a second opinion. <laughs> it's like the guy who went to the doctor. The doctor says, you know, I think, you know, I, I, I think you're overweight. He said, well, I want a second opinion. He said, well, you're ugly too. <laughs> That's about the second opinion you're going to get from the devil, amen. He's going to come up with something else. You, you respond from a whole different format. We've been dealing with it for weeks. I don't belong to you. I'm not accountable to you. I don't have to answer to you. I've been rescued. I've been put, placed with new garments on my life. This wickedness has been cleaned. I've been saved from the judgment. I've been saved from the hell, uh, the fires of hell. You, know, you can't determine or pronounce a sentence on me. There's only one judge and it is God. I'm not buying it. I'm not buying it. In this picture it says, so the Lord removes the filthy garments from Joshua. Now, the reason he does this is ultimately because the, the charges that Satan brings are, are groundless. Why are they groundless? You say, well, I did, I did send you. They're groundless because Jesus forgave you of your sin. Well, that was yesterday's sin. No, Jesus died for all sin, for all men, for all time. You've been forgiven. But what if I sin, you know, on the 13th of August at 3 o'clock? <laughs> Your sin's still paid for. 
It should grieve your heart that you're doing something that Jesus died for, that you could be free of. It, you, you, when you start really realizing what's all involved here, it does away with that cheap grace mindset, doesn't it? I'll just forget it. I'll confess it later. You, know, you can't live like that when you really begin to realize the cost and the price that's involved here with the precious Son of God and the precious blood of Jesus. And he answered and spoke to those that stood before him, take away the filthy garments from him. Set this fair miter, this turban upon his head and clothe, clothe him in righteousness, basically, is what's happening here. Now in Romans chapter 5 and 6 and 7 and 8, you see a very clear picture of all this that takes place. So he talks about we're saved by grace, the faith of Jesus Christ. We now have access to God. We're in his courts because of what Jesus has done for us. We can stand in, in the presence of God and give glory because of our faith in Christ Jesus. We've been redeemed. In fact, it says in Romans 5, he's given us the gift of this new wardrobe, this gift of righteousness. Now, it, we have responsibilities. All my sins paid for, but I don't want to go out and do it and grieve the Spirit and create havoc in my life and hurt the people that love me the most and ruin my own life on, on top of it all and live in accusation by the enemy all my life. Some decisions have to be made. In fact, the Lord admonishes him to respond at this point, and he speaks to him very clearly. He says, Here's, now, now that you have been made righteous, it was a gift. If you'll walk in my ways and keep my charge, and you will, then you will, you will judge my house. You shall keep my courts. I'll give you a place to walk among these that stand by. Now, all those things that God said you could do were not conditioned to anything else but the relationship that had been established. God says, because you're mine now, you can enjoy my, my, my presence. You can walk with me. You can walk with Jesus. You can experience this new life. But, hey, you need to do what you're supposed to do. You need to live a spirit-filled life. You need to live a spirit-led life. You, you need to live a, a life that rejects what Satan's seeking to do in your life, rejecting those things because now you have power to do it, and walk, in a new, walk with a new identity that you have. Live out your identity in Christ. Live out who you are in him. Walk daily now, basically being filled with the Holy Spirit. He said, you're going to govern my house, you'll walk in my courts. What does that mean? That means you'll share the authority that I've given you. You'll, you'll, you'll have authority on your life. So that Satan will have to shut up when you tell him to shut up. So he will have to flee when you resist him. You've been given authority over him. Don't you know it ticks off Satan every time he sees a believer that begins to discover who they are that God would take a created man, which seems to be much lower than the angels, and show him off to the cosmos, say, look what I can do in a man. I think that's what Colossians alludes to. You can read it later. He's made a display of his grace and a display of his redeeming power to a fallen humanity. Now you can enjoy fellowship with the Father. Now, this is where Christians get in a little trouble here because they, they don't buy into I'm free in Jesus they buy into the lie. And then they come to church. And the word is preached to them. And they get the feelings hurt. And we'll go, well, he's just judging me. Or they get with some other Christian who says, hey, man, your life is really messed up. When are you going to do something about that? Well, who do you think you are to judge me? If you, some of you have been there, right? You've dealt with that with brothers and sisters and other people of the Lord. And, 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 and they just kind of react in that certain way. You think you're better than me? No, it's not it at all. We're saying you can walk in freedom. Am I supposed to be like you? No, you're not supposed to be, supposed to be like Jesus. And they get offended. And instead of the sweet fellowship of brothers being able to admonish and encourage or even reprove one another, there comes condemnation in their heart and their life. Accusation is the way it comes off to them. And they feel like they're being accused. I mean, they really feel like they're being accused. Well, how does that happen? Now, I think we probably need to understand and recognize there's a critical difference between accusation and conviction. Paul writes this, and he gives us the difference. He says, I now rejoice, not that you were made sorrowful, but that you were made sorrowful to the point of repentance. And I know some of you, that sounds like a preacher. I'm glad I made you sorry. You don't miss it, all right? You were made sorrowful to the point of repentance, for you were made sorrowful according to the will of God in order that you might not suffer the loss of anything. And he goes on to say, the sorrow that's according to the will of God produces a repentance without regret. Most people live with regrets. And it leads to salvation. But there is the sorrow of the world, it produces death. 
In other words, we hear a message and we're going to respond to it one of two ways. We're, we know we're not right. We know we're not where we ought to be. And we're, going to, we're either going to get mad or we're going to get glad kind of thing, isn't it? That's where it goes. And, and by the way, either situation, here's the guy who's getting mad. Here's the guy that's getting glad. They both sense emotionally a feeling that's the same. He says, you both feel sorry. There's sorrow. I feel bad about that. I feel bad about how I'm living. I feel bad about what I said. I feel bad about what I did. Both feel sorry. But something begins to happen in, in, in the heart. The, the way that word is, receives is one receives it, and it's a sorrow that will, it's a godly sorrow. And one is a worldly sorrow. It's like, it's the flesh or it's the spirit. Is the way it breaks down to it. In fact, you can break it all down like that. If we're walking according to the Spirit, we say, I really want what God wants for my life, then we receive this conviction. But if we're kind of wrapped up in our own little world doing what we want to do and we don't want to hear about it, then we receive this condemnation. If you're with me still, just kind of nod your head. So when the Word is preached, how I'm feeling, well, we all feel the same about it. We, if the light comes on, we see the darkness, and I don't like that. I'm sorry about that. But what, what do we do? Are we going to allow it to, will it be something we receive in the Spirit, or we just continue to justify ourselves and rationalize our sin and look at everybody else and find somebody that's worse off than we are, whatever it might be? There is a sorrow, he's saying here, that leads to a spiritual conviction for the person who really wants to love God and walk with God. You know, and when that comes, yeah, it's still sorrowful, but you, you come to the place and say, I am sorry, Lord. I offended you. I offended the cross. I, I shamed the name of Jesus. I, 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 you know, I hurt somebody else. I, I hurt you. And, and we grieved your spirit. I, I stepped across the boundaries that you laid. God, I sinned. And we get that first John 1 now, right? That if we confess our sins, that God is faithful and just to forgive us. Why does he do that? Because it's all been taken care of. It can all be forgiven because the sentence has been taken care of, of death. So now I'm just kind of appropriating and receiving what God said I could have. God says, listen, I write to you little children that you sin not. Oh, but if you do, <laughs> and you will, like I can say we're not sinless, but we, when we live for Jesus, we sin less. You're not sinless, so you come to play, I just need, I need grace. The accuser comes at this point and says, oh man, what's the use? You've done that before where you failed here. And he just kind of fills your mind with all this lies and all this junk, and, 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 and you just buy into it. Or you come to the place and say, this is wrong, I receive it, I do have sorrow in my life, and I know that's not the way God's called me to live, and I know I have the power to live differently, and I, I, I get that right with you, God. I'm, forgive me and cleanse me. And he says, he does that. And it's cast in the sea of his forgiveness. It is done, it is dealt with. And you're living in the power of the Holy Spirit. The other kind over here, if I don't get it right, it just becomes accusation, and it's like this. Grinding it in. Every time I think about it, grinding is... That's why I like people like getting drunk. That's why I like to get drunk when I used to get drunk. <laughs> well, I got drunk because I had to think about the grinding process. And I didn't realize, you know, that the devil's a pretty good swimmer. He just swam to the top later and started all over again. And, and, and we're living in a culture that anesthetizes itself, are we not? Everybody's got their little mother's little helpers they used to call them, you know? Pop a little pee off feel better. No, you feel nothing. And here he says, you need to feel something. You need to feel sorrow for what you've done. You don't need to anest You don't need, to, and some people don't do that. They just, they just have another escape mechanism. I just, yeah, it's my mother's fault. My husband, you know, look at him. Look what he, look, it's my wife. If she wasn't that way, I, I wouldn't be this way. Or my kids, man, you don't know what I'm to live with at my house. They're nuts. And so we, we, it's a different way, but now we have an excuse. It's all the same. Instead of being beat up and, and pushed down and run in the ground and ground like powder, let God do something in your heart. Say, Lord, is there something you're saying to me here? Because I need, surely need to receive it. Because I want to be what you want me to be. I think the best illustrated in scriptures in, in the lives of two of the disciples. One is Peter and the other one's Judas. They both denied the Lord and betrayed him. Judas did it for some money. Peter did it out of pride. You know, he just, he, I don't know him, I don't know him. And he starts cursing to prove he's not a disciple. You know, it's a good sign you're not a disciple. You start using filthy language. Come on, guys, lesson lined up. <laughs> so Judas, you know, he comes and he sells the Lord out in Luke 22. He realizes what he's done. And if you look at it, he's remorseful. He is weeping. He's a broken man. 
And all this accusation and condemnation is coming. You know what he does? He goes out and he hangs himself because he can't take the grinding. He doesn't respond to it properly. I'm not going to get into that argument, could he, would he, should he, whatever. But I'm just saying, that's a good illustration of conviction that's not dealt with properly. You know why so many people are killing themselves today? Why people are doing the same thing in their lives? is because they're under accusation. You're no good. You'll never amount to anything. You're worthless. You're, you're stupid. You're ugly. And on and on it goes. There's no hope for you. You blew it big time. Don't think there's any way out of this deal. You're messed up. Boy, your, your mama is not going to, your daddy, they're going to be so shamed. You just need to kill yourself. And he doesn't just stop there. He, he does it daily. You need to kill yourself. You need to kill yourself. Anybody's ever had that before, those suicidal thoughts? You know what I'm talking about. It's, 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 it's like, uh, I remember, I think it was Wilkerson wrote a book called Suicide, an Illicit Lover. He said, it's like Satan wants to take you out for a date and just keep feeding you this. Just kill yourself. You know, it'll be so much easier. And, you know, but this is, that's his aim, isn't it? Not that he comes to steal, kill, and destroy, right? So if you're in that mode, hey, I, I got a better way of death. You know, there's a better way of dying. You die to sin. You die to self. I mean, I had a guy call me at 2 o'clock one, in the morning. Went, I'm going to kill myself. I said, man, it's about time. <laughs> I told him that. What do you mean? I said, God, that's exactly what God wants you to do. Die to yourself. Drop dead to yourself. You can come to life then. But you can have to turn your back on that old guy and drop dead to him. On the other hand, here's Peter. He does the same thing. He denies the Lord. And how, I mean, if you watch the whole story with Peter, it starts with pride. And I think this is where it even starts with Judas. But it starts with pride. And the Lord sees it in his life. And in the same chapter in Luke 22, you know, you start seeing how the Lord deals with him. There's one point where Jesus is talking to, to the disciples and they start arguing among themselves. Who's going to be the greatest? Remember that story? And they say, well, I'm going to be the greatest. I'm going to get to sit through right here Jesus. And then, then I think some parents get involved, and they're all arguing about who's going to be the greatest and who's going to get to sit with Jesus. And it's just pride. It's just entering in. And so the Lord, being committed to each of us, will allow the enemy some opportunities in our life to get us to the place of humility. And, and just remember that the devil can't touch your life without permission. He can tempt you and entice you to come to him, and, and you do. But the Bible says in 1 John, the wicked one cannot touch us. I mean, God has to allow something. Most of the time, he doesn't have to because we allow it. But so here, here's Peter, and the Lord turns, to, the Lord turns to, 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 to Peter and says, you know, Peter, I just had a conversation with the devil, and he's asked for permission to sift you like wheat. Peter thinks, I'm glad you didn't tell him he could. But that's not what the Lord said. He's asked for permission to sift you. He wants to put you through the grinding mill. And Jesus said, verse 32, but I prayed for you. Permission was granted, basically, but I prayed for you. Peter, at that point, says he, you know, he gets down a little bit, a couple of verses after that. Peter said, Lord, I'll never deny you. I'll die for you no matter what it takes. You can count on me no matter what. And all this pride, just how spiritually he is, I'll never, it's still raining his heart. But if you follow Peter's life, his conviction ultimately leads to repentance and restoration because he gets his heart right with God. And the Lord, you know, does a work in his life. The remorse that we sense in our heart. We have to make a decision at this point. Well, am I going to allow this to draw me to Christ and get right with God? Or am I going to allow this thing to turn into accusation and condemnation because I'm rejecting Christ? And that's exactly where it goes every time. No matter who you are. Satan's constantly continuing this work of accusation against us. Jesus, on the other hand, he tells Peter, but I am praying for you. Jesus' work is intercession for you. Satan's work is accusation of you. Hebrews 7.25 says, wherever Jesus is able to save them to the uttermost. Amen. If you've given your life to Christ, you've been saved to the uttermost. All right. One guy says, from the guttermost to the uttermost. I've been saved, and he goes on to say, so that we can come to God through Jesus Christ. Then he goes on to say, seeing that Jesus ever lives to make intercession for us. Do you realize that right now, 
Christ stands in the presence of the Father, interceding on your behalf. 1 John chapter 2, verse 1. My little children, these things I write unto you that you don't sin. But if you do sin, you have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. If you do blow it, go to Jesus. He's your lawyer. I mean, you've been to jail before. You don't have to raise your hands. First thing people want to know in the jail, I need to talk to my lawyer. Hey, first time you start heading towards Satan's jail, talk to your lawyer. All right, next time you stand in the courtroom of accusation, you have a lawyer. You need to turn to him. He's working on your case. There's a prosecutor. It's the enemy. He's not interested in you. He wants to destroy you. He wants to ruin you. You talk to Jesus. Now, here's the good thing about this whole courtroom situation. Who's the, who's the judge again? God. Who's your lawyer? God and Jesus happen to be father and son. If I'm going to court, I want my lawyer to be the son of the judge. <laughs> Don't you think? That seems to kind of work. I feel good about going into court if my lawyer's the judge's son. And he said, you've got Jesus. And why can he argue on your behalf? And why can you be free as a result of it? Because he paid the price for that disobedience. He paid the price for that sin. And you can be free. So when conviction, when God starts dealing with you, don't run out and make a huffy, puffy little display about, you know. Come to Christ. Don't set aside that conviction. The, one of the greatest and sweetest, most endearing thing that God does for you and I is convict us and woo us and draw us when we sin. He appeals to us to draw us to him. It's important that we quickly respond, especially if you're in that mode of accusation. You respond to that by saying, letting the enemy know, you know, listen, I don't belong to you. I belong to Christ. I, yes, I did fail, but I'm coming to Jesus and I'm getting this thing right with God and I'm getting my heart right with God. We quickly respond. I mean, everybody in this room at some time, especially if you're a Christian for any length of time or even as a young believer, you blew it. Well, anybody here not like that since you got saved, you just blew it big? Oh, there are? Just fly around the room once. We'd like to see who you are. <laughs> Yes, you have. You say, well, uh, nobody knew about it. God did. It's still. You know, I, I've done some really stupid stuff since I've been saved. What was it? I don't know. I can't find it. It's somewhere in the God's sea of forgetfulness. <laughs> so when Satan comes to try to accuse me, I say, that's how I've been dealt with. He took care of that. I'm free. I'm a child of God. I'm walking with God. You, you, if you don't, then you start living with whatever he's accusing you of. And you maintain and you adopt it and you embrace it. And all of a sudden you are worthless and you are good for nothing. And you are just believe all that stuff. And your life never amounts to anything. If you continue to live that kind of life, it's going to produce some severe emotional problems in your life to start with. I mean, you're going to, it's going to, and then it's going to produce even deeper problems. You don't get right again. It goes from, you know, to just issues that start in your life that you can't, you know, from depression to obsession to possession right on down the line. You're just kind of living out there on the edge where Satan just beats you up regularly. So that's not the way you want to live your life. That's not the way God intended you to live your life. You know, you kind of have to get to the point where I'm willing to put my feelings, the sorrow I have to the test. And the test ultimately is the word of God. I'm feeling something. What is it? Is it accusation or is it conviction of the Holy Spirit? Well, the Word of God will, will direct that. Amen? I can take it to God. I can say, Lord, like David said, search me, see if there is any wicked way in me. God will make it clear to you. If it's some false accusation, because Satan will do that as well, then you'll know. Because the Spirit of God lives in you to guide you in this process and to make the Word relevant and alive to you in this process. So you do not believe anything if it doesn't line up with the Word of God. That's your standard. That's your test. But on the other hand, you need to believe everything that God says about you. God says, you're an overcomer. That settles it. But I don't feel like an overcomer. I don't care what you feel like. You're still an overcomer. Well, I'm not acting like it. Well, stop it. You know, you're an overcomer. Start living like one. Do it. How often does God present something like that? And we look at it more like a challenge than a promise. And God just promised you. Oh, I don't know. Let me see if I can do that. But <laughs> you doing nothing except yielding to what he said and trusting him. Uh, you know, trusting him. It's like the little kid on the side of the swimming pool who's 
just, you know, standing there, a little four-year-old kid, and you're saying, jump into my arms, jump, I'll catch you, I'll catch you. You know, God's not going to step out of the way. <laughs> He's going to catch you. You trust him and you believe and you see what God does. You believe everything that God says about you. Why? Because Jesus made it clear in John 8, you shall know the truth, that's the word of God, and the truth will set you free. I had so much junk in the trunk, so to say, in my life before I came to Christ. I mean, just bad stuff. I was messed up. About a month before I gave my life to Jesus, I'm under a lot of accusation. I'm miserable, all right? A lot of condemnation. And my brother telling me about Jesus did not help in my mind. <laughs> you know, it was just more miserable. And I remember I, I was living in an apartment in southwest Houston. And uh, I was in my bedroom and I woke up and I looked up on the wall. And I've shared this in my testimony before if you hadn't heard it before. But some of you have. And there was this big poster, you know. And the poster was, was, um, was all this uh, table just filled with, you know, marijuana had been processed and the seeds are all stacked on one side and there's this big bowl with marijuana pouring out of it and then there's all the clips and papers and pipes all around it and on the bowl in large letters says good humor I thought that was a cool poster until that morning when the lights came on I got out of I was so ticked off at myself I thought, arms you have been wasting your life he's wasting it that wasn't the only thing. There's a bunch of junk I'm talking about. All right? You've been wasting. Is that the way you live your life? I didn't realize this is the Holy Spirit. At the same time, the devil's saying, look how sorry you are. I got out of bed. I literally, I got out of bed. I'm mad now. I got out of bed, mad at me. And I reached up and, you know, tore that poster off the wall and ripped it in half. Whoosh, threw it on the floor. Ticked off. I went into my living room, sat down at the table, and smoked a joint. I so mad. You know what that is? That's bondage. Paul said, you know, all things might be lawful for me, but I'll not be in bondage to anything. I don't be in bondage to anything. The only thing we need to be in bondage to is Jesus. And everything else came real good news when I gave my life to Jesus. I realized I don't have to. Not only do I not have to be in bondage, I don't even have to do it to start with. I'm free in Christ. I have now the power to say no, which I had no power before. Much less of anything. And that's the way it is with Jesus. You say, well, I've never been there. Well, good. I'm glad you haven't. But some of you, it's, it's, not, it's not processed drugs laying out on the table or hidden in a corner somewhere. Some of you, it's unforgiveness. You know, some of you, it's gossip. Some of you are greedy. You're selfish. Boy, every time you hear a sermon, it has to do with money. You're talking about it around there. That's a poor accusation around here. We don't even pass an offering plate. But whenever it's brought up, what is it? Why do we stir it up inside? I don't want to hear that sermon. I don't want to talk about that. I just can't talk about it. Accusation or conviction? What are we going to do with it? If we'll say, and now it's just important. And say, how, much, how, how come you know so much about this? Been there, done that. <laughs> All right, been there, done that. You come to the point and say, what's, what's, what's the right way? God, it's this in my life. I don't want to get rid And I, I say, Lord, I need to get to the altar and confess and get right with you. And what happens? Freedom. Freedom. Freedom in Christ. Amen? Yes. That's your victory. That's your claim. I, I told you coming back from Belize a couple weeks ago, coming through customs, that lady asked me, do you have anything to declare? I said, freedom in Christ. <laughs> <laughs> scared her, but she gave me a high five before I walked out. <laughs> Frank was behind me saying, amen! You know, Frank. <laughs> we have it. Let's enjoy it. Let's live it. But if there's junk, lay it on the altar. It's paid for. It's been forgiven. Walk in the freedom of it now. Experience it. See what God does in your life. Let's stand with our heads bowed. Father, we thank you.